art and creative expression are at the heart of what makes us human. A social or political movement that isn't fueled by vibrant and deeply inspiring art and music has a hole in its soul and probably shouldn't be trusted. As we learn to appreciate more keenly the key relationship of arts to social change, I hope we're coming to value our artists in a deeper way. As one activist in British Columbia told me, it was more difficult for me to come out as an artist than as a lesbian. <laughs> Around the world, artists are responding in abundantly creative ways to the calls of the earth and people in trouble. In Queensland, an Australian Aboriginal artist named Dr. Pamela Croft makes mud maps integrating the language of her indigenous art form with the tangible evidence of climate change to the creek nearby, where the altering tides create delicate patterns in the mud. She does this to inspire people to act. She also makes this art to challenge non-Aboriginal people to come to an understanding of the world as her people see it, a people who are estimated to have inhabited this land for over 50,000 years. Like these mud maps, Judy Baca's murals are as much about the process of how they're made as they are about the end result. Each artist begins from the awareness that the land has a memory that must be expressed. Both create art that's shaped by an interactive relationship among history, people, and place that marks the dignity of hidden historical precedents, restores connections, and stimulates new relationships into the future. Judy Baca's murals focus on revealing and reconciling diverse people's struggles for their rights and affirm the connections of each community to that place. She gives form to monuments that rise up out of neighborhoods rather than being imposed on them. Together with the people who live there, they co-create monumental art, places that become sites of public memory. Judy is a world-renowned painter and muralist, community arts pioneer, scholar, and, and educator who has been teaching art in the UC system, including at UCLA, for over 20 years. She was the founder of the first City of Los Angeles mural program in 1974, which evolved into a community arts organization known as the Social and Public Art Resource Center, or SPARC. She continues to serve as its artistic director and focuses her creative energy in the Cesar Chavez Digital Mural Lab, employing digital technology to co-create collaborative mural designs. Judy's public art in, uh, in initiatives reflect the lives and concerns of populations that have been historically disenfranchised, including women, the working poor, youth, the elderly, and immigrant communities. Throughout Los Angeles, and increasingly in national and international venture, venues, Sparks projects have often been created in impoverished neighborhoods that have been revitalized and energized by the attention that these murals have brought and the excitement that they have generated. Underlying all of Spark's activities is the profound conviction that the voices of disenfranchised communities need to be heard and that the preservation of a vital commons is critical to a healthy civil society. Judy Baca's work channels the creative process of monumental mural design to help develop models for the transformation of both physical and social environments in public spaces. And she does mean monumental, both in space and time. The Great Wall of Los Angeles is tattooed across a flood control channel in the San Fernando Valley. It's currently the world's longest mural at 2,400 feet long. The Great Wall depicts a multicultural history of California from prehistory through the 1950s. It was begun in 1976, and plans are underway for its next four decades of evolution. Drawing from diverse traditions ranging from the great Mexican muralists such as Rivera and Siqueiros, to some of the WPA's public art initiatives of the 30s, to Joseph Boy's experiments in social sculpture, 
What Judy has initiated and nurtured in Los Angeles may represent the grandest, most ambitious and empowering authentic people's art project in the U.S. over the last 60 years and the most diverse one ever. It's therefore both a great honor and a joy to welcome back to this stage one of the most remarkable public artists for social transformation in modern American history, Judy Baca. Wow. I want to say hello to all the 18 other sites and acknowledge that listening to Nina this morning, I thought I was a political landscape painter, but I realize I'm a bioneer. <laughs> it begins with a river. The city of Los Angeles was founded on the banks of this river. There, the first Tongva villages were formed. In the shades of the trees, that brought uh, cooling to the arid desert landscape that was Los Angeles with seasonal water. The river expanded in the winter, contracted in the summer. Whoops, excuse me, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here. The Tongva people moved with the river and they accommodated its receding and expanding waters. The settlements were formulated alongside of these Tongva villages, the first missions, the Melatos, the Mexican people, all formulated. Excuse me, the, the, the computer is moving by itself. <laughs> A poltergeist, <clears throat> magically moving. The first Spanish settlements uh, were formulated alongside of these villages. But in the 1930s, after a particularly bad period of flooding, it was determined by our city fathers that the river had to be tamed. The river had overflowed its allotted space and destroyed valuable real estate, by then Los Angeles' most valuable commodity. If you look at this, you can see that the doorways of the first Sonora town village or five feet above the ground to accommodate the moving waters. <clears throat> as a child, I watched as the rivers turned to concrete. The arteries of the land were hardened. I think I can trace the beginnings of my career as a political landscape painter to growing up alongside of the Los Angeles River and watching its transition. I remember the moment when I came to the Flood Control Channel and stood with the Army Corps of Engineers, Aesthetic Recovery Division, and looked down at this river. <laughs> the 40-year-long project was complete. They had concreted every river in Los Angeles. The new Aesthetic Recovery Division, though short-lived, its purpose was to deal with the concreted arroyos. They were eyesores. They left dirt belts on either side of the channels. They divided communities. The flood control channels, of course, had many other serious consequences to the land. The concreted rivers carried runoff water swiftly to the ocean, bearing pollution from the city streets, affecting the Santa Monica Bay, depriving the aquifer of water replenishment through normal ground seepage. In a sense, the concreting of the river represented the hardening of the arteries of the land and created dis-ease in the land. What I saw was a metaphor. The hundreds of miles of concrete conduits were scars in the land. They recalled the scars I'd seen on a young man's body in a Los Angeles barrio, in my early work with the gangs of East Los Angeles. Fernando, my friend and mentee, had suffered multiple stab wounds in East Los Angeles gang warfare. I asked him how he was feeling after the attack. My wounds are healing, he said, but every time I lift my shirt, my body is a map of violence. So together we began to design transformative tattoos 
in an effort to make the ugly marks in something powerful and beautiful. He loved to say he was my greatest artwork. <laughs> that day overlooking the channel, I dreamed of a tattoo on the scar where the river once ran as a metaphor for healing our city's division of race and class and proposed the Great Wall of Los Angeles. I dared not speak aloud the words that I'm saying today, that the concreting of the river was an act of violence against the earth and healing was needed for both the river and for the people of the river, all of those who lived alongside of its banks. For 12 years, I worked with 400 young people on the recovery of their histories, practicing a connection between each other across race, class, and gender differences. We worked to tattoo the scar where the river once ran in the San Fernando Valley with images that would remember our dismembered history. Lifelong connections were made there between all of us. I was a participant as well as an initiator. The vehicle for this was art, the result, the longest mural in the world. And what I realized from this position today that I wasn't much different than they were. It was apparent to me then, as it is today, that this decision to concrete the Los Angeles River would affect the people of the city for generations to come in subsequent planning and development decisions and a spiritual discord associated with the land. A relationship exists between the disappearance of the river and the people. If you can disappear a river, how much easier is it to disappear the history of the people? We painted 2,700 feet of mural, a half a mile of imagery on the river. We excavated our own stories, our family stories to recover our history left out of history books. Hundreds of artists and scholars and members of, of the public contributed time, knowledge, and their own memories for the making of the Long Wall. Today, the original children of the Great Wall are grown, and they are returning, returning as alumni to work with another generation of Great Wall youth. I'm proud to announce that the Great Wall has been declared a site of public memory worth preservation by the State of California's Cultural and Historical Endowment. Sometimes we get it right. And they have funded us for $1.3 million as seed money to begin to re repair the historic sections now, some of which are 30 years old. But as important as remembering that story and rec recovering the mural, it is equally important to remember the people who produced the work. This is Ernestine Jimenez. She's 14 in this picture. She's one of the 400 youth who worked with us on the production of the mural. She was incarcerated at this moment. She was pregnant and on drugs. She was what they called a throwaway, a person who would not benefit from this experience. I don't take directions well. <laughs> I hired Ernestine, and here she is two years later, four years later at 18, with her son Ern, uh, um, Rudy, and at 44 with her son, as she was interviewed about the Great Wall. Asked about the meaning of the wall, this is what she had to say. The way I grew up is, you know, you fight through life. You know, I've got 10 brothers and six sisters, and I'm the baby. And it was a fight in my house all the time. And that's the way I believed you were supposed to have grown up, to fight through life. Don't like nobody but your own race. And even sometimes don't even like your own race. There was a lot of tension. Um, I think everybody wanted to fight everybody, just the way they looked or the way they looked at them, or the way they dressed. And after time, 
you just started get, getting to know that person as an individual instead of knowing them as you were taught to, you know? And everybody became very good friends, so. It took a lot, a lot of growing up. I'm not saying that first year did it, because it didn't. It took a lot of growing up. But I made a lot of friends through the four years, and every year I understood something else, every year. I wouldn't have went back to high school because I wouldn't have had a role model to push me to go there. Education was Judy's number one thing. As long as I stood in school, you can come back and paint the mural. And that's what, even though I got in trouble in school and fought and everything, that was my number one goal. I wanted to come back. I had to come back. What really kind of freaked me out, though, is when I met the people that, when we painted the mural of the Holocaust, and I met the people that had the tattoos on them, that kind of blew my mind. That Actually, that made me cry. Because I know there was another world that was harder than mine. And I just really felt for it. This mural opened my eyes so much. Even when I'm down and out, I still walk by here. And I thank God I did accomplish something in life. And it makes me feel good. And I think if it wasn't for this mural, for me to have my name on it and to have accomplished something, I don't know where I'd be. one gang member at a time. New segments are being developed today that draw relationships between the healing of the river and the people. These designs proposed by my students are interpreting the 1960s. They are young people born in the 80s. This is a virtual rendition of their proposed des uh, designs for the next segments of the, of the Great Wall, 360 feet on a virtual wall. Let's take a look at it for one minute. proposed by the students placed on the virtual wall so that you can actually have the sense of the scale and the monumentality of the work that they're proposing. All young people in their 20s. We are developing a new interpretive site on the Great Wall to bridge the gap that the river has made between two communities. The green bridge is proposed for the site. It will be constructed of the debris from the river, at least in part. If you see the glass and the plastic will be embedded in the, in the, in the river uh, bridge and also it will be lit by solar panels. Um, visualizing the next connections between the history of the river and the people we at Spark are putting another generation to work on reclaiming our history and tattooing the scar where the river once ran. La memoria de nuestra tierra. This is another work that has to do with my own story and the story of my family. I think that I began, began to understand the notion of the land having memory because of my grandmother, Francisca, an indigenous woman who practiced healing practices in our family. Everything in her world had a place. If something was taken from the land, something was returned. She asked plants for, for permission when she took a cutting to plant them. She could make a dried twig grow. 
Everything had a purpose in Francisca's world. Even what I thought were weeds growing by the water fountain, she turned into exquisite vegetables with frijoles. The distance between dreaming and making real is very small, she taught me. And it is because of this that I tried to imagine for artists and for my students the notion of how land can be excavated for its memory, starting with its inherent nature, looking at the topography as it currently exists, and understanding that all land has a spirit. It's made by all the people who pass through it, by all the living things. The inherent nature of it is whether it was formed by a glacier, for example. But look, we enter late. And this is a reminder that, in fact, history does not begin when we come through the door. In this work in the Denver International Airport, we produced a 50-foot piece by 10-foot piece that is the Hispano history of the Southwest. My grandparents came from Mexico during the Mexican Revolution from a place called Chihuahua. They followed the course of hundreds of thousands of other people who left during this revolution through the historic northern territories of Mexico, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado. They came through the Alice Island of the Southwest, El Paso. It's a story in which there's very little chronicling uh, in existence, and for one for which I was really anxious to create a visual record. We looked at the land as if it could be excavated, as if the memory was embedded in the place. And here you can see the miners of Chihuahua, a famous meeting between Corky and a Gonzalez and Cesar Chavez, the Cheyenne woman, and a photograph to the furthest right is a photograph I found in a museum of my grandfather working on the railroad. He's the only person facing out without the proper attire. Um, the caminantes, the walkers, are walking on water, making the transit between Mexico and the United States in a collision of landscapes as they travel across um, these distance to come to their new home in La Junta, Colorado. This is both a digital image and a painted image, the corn representing the mixture of the races, the creation of the mestizo between Spanish, indigenous, and the third race. My grandfather, with the choices that he had when he arrived, Theodoro could become a farm worker, he could work in the mines, or he could work for the railroad. He chose the railroad. Here are the great leaders bringing a, boy, a great boycott to the Southwest at a particular moment in which they're having an intense discussion. The Ludlow strike, um, and all of us know this story from the, t the song, if you load 16 tons, what do you get? Another day older, a deeper in debt. This is actually about immigrants joining together to improve the conditions of their living in the mines in Colorado. The moment of reconciliation is the Baca family rec reconciliation. My mother was born in La Junta. She was educated in Colorado's segregated school system. She was raised in its segregated housing of the 20s and 30s. The simple fact that in death, the bodies of racially different people were required to remain separate was what moved me to create an artwork that would give dignity to the mestizo story and the stories of countless others who toiled in the mines and fields and railroads of Colorado, not only to tell the sto for stories of forgotten people, but also about the people who moved like birds and water, traveled back and forth across the land freely before there was a line that determined what side you were from. And also to speak of our shared human condition as temporary residents of the earth. Here we're reclaiming my grandfather's grave from the segregated part of the graveyard, making it whole and bringing the family back to honor him. We created a site on the web and this site became an exciting place. I had no idea how people would use it, but I told the story on the internet. Um, I had an opportunity at Harvard to, um, to build it, a uh, kind of interesting and deep ex exploration of the story of that particular migration. And it was because of that that I started to get messages from high school students in Durango, Colorado. They said, Judy, we are in a place in which the Southern Utes, the Navajos, the Latinos and the Asians are fighting. And we have, we're having drive-by shootings. This is the Los Alamos River. And here you can see the site of their city. Well, I went to this place to join the young people. And what I found is everyone faced this mountain. But to some people, the mountain was called Mother Mountain. And to others, it was called Silver Mountain. 
depending on when your family came and your relationship to the mountain. I brought the kids into a practice of mapping their site, of the, mapping their city, very much the kind of work we did with the Great Wall kids. And here you can see the map they produced. At the center is Mother Mountain. All of the little red marks indicate their drawings. And in a cycle of life described to us by the Ute elders, we produced a series of drawings done by the kids talking about when their families came. Here on the left, you see somebody say, my father came and worked on the railroad. My grandfather came on a covered wagon. We turned these into pictographic images. We noticed that people had been photographing from the same site for hundreds of years, from the top of the mountain looking back onto the valley. On the left-hand side is a historical image, on the right, the contemporary um, city. I took a crack at painting Mother Mountain and failed, because actually the message that came back said on the email, this is really not a Ute image. She looks too Hispanic. So, <laughs> I sent on messages, please send photographs of your family and let's begin to people the site. So on the right, you'll see a Hispano wedding. You'll see a wonderful cowboy in the left-hand corner who's somebody's uncle. Ignacio in the left-hand corner, uh, St. Ignacio, who's the chief of the region. The cowboys, the youths in the little red, the little girl in the red shirt relearning her language. Um, I took another um, stab at painting it. This one was accepted by the young people. And we produced this work, um, outputted it, pr uh, printed it, painted it, and then shipped it in a big tube. This is actually the beautiful cowboy staring back at the audience. And this is, at the moment of the dedication, our cowboy at 72, holding court uh, in Durango, Colorado, uh, Mr. Archuleta talking about his memory and recollections of the land. The piece is put in a tube installed on a frame, placed in the public site, and is completely reproducible and able to be placed in sites. Uh, it moved from one site to another. Another site of reconciliation is the migration of the Golden Peeper, but this time a more difficult story, the story of the people of Pico Union in Los Angeles, a place where migrations occurred from people from all over um, El Salvador. And the story is a story of people coming from a war-torn country. The question is, how could you tell the story in such a way that would have meaning and also not be terribly difficult to see? What was exciting about this was that people were determining the images themselves. And in a sense, we were making a Mayan map, a kind of method of looking at each of the stories that people carried with them in the photographs and recovery of that story. Here's a young woman standing in front of the um, uh, riot police. And the final outcome is a 37-foot piece by 15-foot piece with Rigoberta Manchu weaving the story in the sky, the people migrating, um, the, the volcanic mountain, the people being disappeared, a combination of the difficult stories and also the sort of stories of recovery. For the first time, the young people were learning from their parents why they left their home country and what was important about that migration. Here it is installed in this point um, in the, the Caracen Central American Research and Education Center, and also an archive has been made of this particular piece. Here we are with the people. And I'm going to leave you with this, the vision of the future without fear. I've been working on a piece for the last 10 years um, on the recovery of the stories of various countries' visions of the future and asking them to participate, not with large amounts of money, not with commissioning capacity, but simply saying to other artists, could you envision a future without fear? Could you work with us to produce a panel that will travel with a traveling mural around the world? And could you envision peace? And this is an image that is actually our struggle to find the meaning of peace or visual image for peace. What does it look like? If it's the absence of war, what is it the presence of? This is an image that came from our discussions with the Hopis. They said, the world is out of balance. Peace is simple, Judy. It's about maintaining balance, an ever-struggling um, kind of moment. So we're looking here at the balance of the sun and the moon, the earth and the people, and the kinds of things that grow. 
And this is the final image of the World Wall. And I leave you with this. We need a child honoring world. We need a world in balance. And this is all about the, the, the struggle to achieve this. And metaphors are a path. <laughs>